It is beautiful here at the Cancer Survivors Park. I might get distracted by the pretty dogs. Um, um, lots of action outside. So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jeff Jaguer. I'm your host for the Cancer Preven Prevention and Wellness Series. Um, tonight's installment uh, is not only eating well, but um, you know, talking about planning your own food. Um, uh, we have with us uh, Stephanie Hoops, who's a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, an oncology certified nurse. Um, there's some other letters behind her name, and she may be able to tell you what those uh, stand for as well. Um, but she's going to tell us, um, you know, now that spring's upon us, uh, how to plant a garden and, and um, eat what you reap. Um, just as a reminder, um, you will be muted. Um, the chat option is open for any questions. Um, we expect uh, questions. We welcome questions. We will answer those at the end. Uh, this will be kind of a conversation. I will ask questions along the way. Uh, I probably won't take yours, however. Um, also, as a reminder, uh, if you really liked what you heard uh, but didn't hear it all, uh, we will be recording tonight's session and we'll be replaying this on the, um, oncology, on the uh, Cancer Survivors Park website, which uh, is uh, cancer survivors park, all one word, dot org. Um, so, uh, Stephanie, with uh, that introduction, I'll let you take that away, and um, uh, I think you got a lot of knowledge to bring to us. Thank you very much, Dr. Jagir. I appreciate being here. I want to thank the Cancer Survivors Park for having me. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to uh, our student intern at CIOS, Sarah and Tennyson. She helped me put this together and get some of these ideas in a good flowing area. So I'm happy to start talking to you about gardening and sort of the cancer prevention or cancer fighting garden. I am, uh, I would say a beginner gardener, but I have been learning from um, experience. I went from a small container garden in my backyard to a very large backyard and I'm still growing. Um, so what we're gonna do today is go over quickly the health benefits of gardening. We're going to list first steps and how to begin to plan your garden and what are the things that you need to plan a garden. We're gonna review some herbs and vegetables and fruits known to help decrease your cancer risk. Um, and then we'll talk briefly about generic watering recommendations and sunlight requirements. And I'll try to point out some of the things that might be different with some of those different um, plants. And then we're also going to have tips to overcome bugs or excuse me, obstacles. So let's start with the benefits of gardening. So gardening is exercise. And I can tell you that because when I first started doing it, I would get that good hurt at the end of the day um, and notice muscles that were worked that probably hadn't been worked in a while. So treat it as some exercise, but that you get more benefit from. If it's really hot and sunny, most of the time we're doing a lot of gardening in the sun. So make sure you're hydrating, stretch if you have to, cut it down to small periods if you are not an exerciser or a gardener. I know I do 20 minute increments and take a break and make sure I got my water going in. And then it's just a good way to keep your body moving. Uh, use good posture, of course, and your body mechanics. I have a great little bench that I can kneel on. It's got handles that helps me get up from kneeling. So, and I can sit on it when I'm doing other things as well. Um, gardening is great for stress relief. Study shows that when you are outdoors in nature, most of the time that helps relieve your stress and some anxiety. Um, it's great just to be out there breathing in fresh air. Probably not right now because we're in the pollination time of spring. So if you do have allergy, it's probably causing you more stressors to be out there. But it is, a, it is many studies show that being outdoors and in nature is going to help with some stress relief. There's things called earthing where just being uh, barefoot on the ground can help as well. And then of course, eating healthy and nutritious foods. So if you are planting plants, I hope you're planting what you want to eat. Um, Plant-based diets are an excellent way to reduce your risk for cancer and really get involved with growing your own and 
being creative about what you have grown and how to use that um, involving kids. And that is also a great way to get them to uh, eat their fruits and vegetables as well. You might make some friends because you might have a whole lot of stuff and don't know what to do with your crop. So give it away to friends or even um, a food bank might be able to take some of your extras as well. So you're helping other people eat healthily as well. So Stephanie, I heard a new disease um, that they're talking about with the uh, kids uh, on their devices too much and it's called nature deficit disorder. Well, gardening can help that. Exactly. <laughs> Getting them outside, you know, sometimes sports is a great way to get them outside, but gardening is also a good way to help them. They can help weed, they can help plant these, um, these different uh, varieties of plants, watering. You always need somebody to spend some time with the hose and water them real well. So what are the things you need when you're thinking about creating a garden or what do you need to get started? So these are basically the top five, but there are some others, but these are the basically the top five things you're going to need um, for your garden. And a lot of these will over er, interact with each other. So I might be talking about a little bit of space when I'm talking about sunshine as well. So first wanted to just talk about a lot of the information I got was from the All Farmers Almanac and from an app. So you wanna do some research, you wanna look all this stuff up, um, you wanna get the recommendations for plants. Those are great places to start and we'll talk a little bit more once we get into those plants. Uh, sunshine, most fruits and vegetables are going to need sunshine at least six hours a day to allow them to grow and ripen correctly. Um, you can always find your sun requirements on the package of seeds or usually within your plant if you're buying plants. And you can also talk to nurseries and garden centers. They'd love to tell you about the different requirements needed. A lot of places don't have any sun. So you might want to have to pick or you might have to pick shade loving plants or partial sun plants. Um, also remind, mind your, or try to remember where the sun is going to be. Lots of people plan gardens in winter time when the leaves are not on the trees. Well, unfortunately I had planned a great herb garden in the corner of my yard. And come spring, the leaves on that maple tree came and yeah, there's no herbs in that, that garden there. So one of the things we, uh, that, that the series is named is cancer prevention. Um, and we just have to make sure that we're understanding that uh, sun has some negative aspects to it as well. So just from the standpoint of um, what you dress uh, like and you know, how, how long you're out there, it obviously doesn't take long. And do you put any uh, SPF on? So yes, you should put some SPF. Again, usually guard people are gardening in the middle of summer. So that's when the sun is strongest. So you wanna limit your exposures in the sun. Um, maybe do more early morning. It's probably cooler in the early mornings or your later afternoons when the sun's not directly there. SPF 50 on any exposed skin, especially your face wide brim hat or even any hat that has a brim there to help shade your face as well. Um, I'm usually out there in a long sleeve shirt, but a lot of companies are now selling sleeves that go up there and cover your arms so that they, they don't get sunlight as well as get the irritated from the plants. Great, thanks. Okay. And so space. Well, you may be very lucky that have this really big yard and a place in your yard that gets full sun. Um, you may only have a patio or a balcony because you're in an apartment. There may be no space outside for you to use and you have to bring your garden sort of inside and you have windowsills. Um, we can talk a little bit about hydroponics when it comes to that. I think most people will have a little corner that they can do. Um, also, when you're thinking about space, this is where you need to start learning about your plant size. My husband wanted me to grow okra the first year I started, and I, I literally only had a three by four foot plot, and I planted this beautiful little okra plant. Okra gets to be the size of a large tree. Its trunk was the size of my arm. It was huge. So 
know your plant size and realize that if you have something that's going to be growing really large, it's probably not going to be good on a windowsill. This picture here is actually my garden. The top one is what my garden is looking like right now. Um, you can sort of see at the bottom that was what happened over the winter. I do have some sun issues because of the building here. Um, so I'm planting some shade loving plants there. Um, the rest of the garden gets a pretty good amount of sun except along the corner up top because there's a big old maple tree there. So more gifts, tips for gardening in small spaces. Um, trellises and gardening up is a great idea. Um, so your plants aren't growing out. You can use plants that trellis, uh, squash plants like the bee trellis, uh, a lot of tomatoes you can grow up onto a lattice work like that. Grow in containers, in different size containers. I have some container requirements for the plants that we're gonna go over. And then containers are also movable. Remember, if you're using a really large container like these pictured here, um, there's a possibility they're gonna be really heavy. Um, grow on your windowsills. So having a small seven gallon pot on your windowsills in your kitchen, that's a great place to put your herbs. So they're ready for you to be used while you're cooking. Um, the other thing you can do is try hydroponics. So hydroponics is growing without soil. You're going to be using nutrients that a uh, nutrient solution that you buy and water instead of the soil to give the plants what they need. Uh, those nutrient solutions sort of keep the correct amount of elements that the plant needs, things like nitrogen and potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, all of these nutrients plants need to grow. This picture is actually an arrow garden that's in the corner of my kitchen. It's a brand of hydroponics. They have everything from a little three pod system to what they call a harvest or a bounty where it sits in the corner. It's about three feet and it sits in the corner and you can actually grow really larger plants in it. It's a self-contained unit that also has light. Things like lettuce, spinach, peppers, your herbs, they all grow really well in, high, in hydroponic systems. So if this is something that you're interested in, um, there are kits that you can buy, such as the Arrow Garden. There's also a whole uh, line of things that you can make your own Arrow Garden kits using totes and, and a little bit of baskets and nets. Um, YouTube and Google are an endless supply of sources. Now that I told you how to grow without soil, I'm going to mention soil. So soil requirements basically are going to be a little bit different. If you are planting just right into the ground that you have, you're using raised beds and buying soil. Um, most fruits and vegetables needs what's called loamy soil that contains lots of organic material. I also had to look up loam soil. It's a mixture of sand, silk, clay. Um, mostly you can find them in the stores. You can see on the right, that sort of looks like a lot of the soil I have. And most of the soil down here in the South has got a lot of clay in it. Um, so you really need to add some sort of fertilizer into that to help break up that clay and give a little bit more nutrients. The pot on the left has a bunch of sandy, um, sandiness in it. There are some herbs or some plants that do grow pretty well in sandy soil, but what you're aiming for really is in that middle, that nice dark brown, rich with nutrients, um, drain well. If you don't know what soil you have, soil testing would be best for you, especially if you're doing wanting to get a, a really large production of fruits and vegetables and, and want a good yield. Um, the basic test includes not only soil pH, but all of those nutrients we just heard from the hydroponic section, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium. So it'll tell you the requirements your soil needs. Um, Clemson University actually does soil tests. They're about $15. Um, and you basically, if that's something that you're interested in for your garden, uh, web search for soil testing Clemson. 
can help you find their services. They'll send you a little box like that and you send it in and they'll give you a report. So this way you're able to learn what you do need to add into your soil in order for it to produce pretty, pretty much what you want it to. Almost in the end, seeds are plants. You, that, this is the fun part of it. Um, you, you, when you're planting a garden, you wanna decide whether you're doing seeds or whether you wanna just buy plants from your nursery. Seeds are great because there's so many seed catalogs out there and they'll send you a whole bunch of seed catalogs so you can browse through them and see the different varieties. And most of the times those seed catalogs are also telling you what's required, um, what the sunlight is, how much to have the spacing of everything. So you can actually learn a lot from those seed catalogs. Um, you can write to each of those companies. Uh, locally, we have Park Seeds in Greenwood. Um, they're a fairly large seed company. So if you're interested in that whole local movement, that would be a great place to buy some seeds. Baker's Creek is another um, seed company. They have a huge catalog that offers a lot of information. This year, I bought a lot of my seeds from a company called Fedco, um, mainly because I liked their catalogs. It's, it reminds me of a Trader Joe catalog. It was all hand, hand drawn pictures and a lot of great information. How do you spell that? Fedco is F-E-D-C-O. So F is in Fred. Yep, Fedco. And so they have not only uh, fruits and vegetables, but they do have trees, bushes, things like that. So they, they do have a lot to offer. And a lot of the catalogs will also offer things like containers and trays and things to start your seedlings. So it's all inclusive shopping there. But don't forget your garden stores, Lowe's and Home Depot have a bunch of plants out there your farmer's market, going down to the farmer's market and looking at the plants and buying there. Those people who are selling their plants are going to tell you how to be successful in growing them and also your local nurseries. So plants are seeds. I, I remember, you know, the egg cartons, the half of the, the milk carton, um, and you get your kids to maybe put the plants, uh, to put the seeds in the dirt and see them become little seedlings and then you can plant them in your garden. That is a great, again, a great way to involve the kids in order to get them very interested in that and then having them see what comes from that little seed all the way up to the fruit. That's really exciting for them. And like you said, you can plant in anything, egg cartons. Um, I save egg cartons. I save toilet paper rolls. I have a bunch of seedlings and toilet paper rolls. Um, my husband thinks I'm a pack rat, but my friends have given me the, their plant pots that they got their plants out of. So I have some of those. So you really can plant in anything and have them grow beforehand. So if your kids grow their vegetables, they're more, more likely to eat their vegetables. Oh, absolutely. And I prefer seeds just because I'm, I'm pretty fortunate where I have the space and the time to start the seeds. Plants are more convenient. Um, Price-wise, plants are going to cost you the same about as a package of seeds. So seeds are more efficient, but you still need trays for them to grow and an area for them to grow, um, whereas plants are basically ready to dig a hole and put them on in. Right. And then last but not least is water. So Plants need to be watered regularly and you cannot really rely upon rain. We know our weather patterns are changing, so we don't always get the rain. It was supposed to rain most of today and we didn't get any. So um, you really wanna think about how you're gonna water your plants. Are you going to water just from your hose, stand in there with the spray? That takes up a lot of time. Are you going to put a sprinkler system in? I personally are using soaker hoses. Um, because it is best to water a plant by the ground and by the roots. A lot of plants do not like wet leaves. And then, you know, if your garden is bigger, if you have that big field that gets great sun, where is the water source to that? How are you going to carry the water to that big field for it to get what it needs? Um, most school of thought says watering in the morning is best. It helps to prevent evaporation, especially in the heat. Um, sometimes watering overnight 
They've said, I've heard that it can cause some mold or, or mildew issues. I personally water when I get home from work because I don't have time to do it before work. And I haven't really had a problem for that. So as somebody who has drowned more plants than let them die from underwatering, mm -hmm. um, how, how do you know? You, how do you test? Test the soil. Touch the soil or even dig into the soil a little bit. If it's still moist, if it still seems to be um, moist a couple of um, inches down, it probably doesn't need a whole lot of water. Um, I think there are some plants that will require constant moisture. So that's the thing. Most plants are requiring water weekly or maybe a little bit more when it gets extremely hot. So before we move on to any of the plants, are there any questions before we go to the individual plants and their benefits? Step, I don't see anything in the chat box, so I, I need uh, people to put their thinking cabots on. I, 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 would, I did want to remark on your slides. I, I know I've seen these before, but it looks like somebody got a hold of them. And, and I don't little... know what happened. That happened while we were talking. Oh, what <laughs> happened? So, so this you is can't a, see this that. Is a I this, can notice. This is a Zoom thing, huh? This is a. This I don't know if it's a Zoom thing, but it, I, I didn't want to touch anything and mess the rest of it up. Wow. That's what uh, I said. Okay, so you guys can see the, the abstract art that's on the side there. Yeah, no, I thought this was just a new way of, of presentation here. So th this is. Yeah, no, that happened about the second or third slide, and I didn't question it because I was like, it's there and it's not going away. <laughs> okay, well, well it, then it, it, was meant, it was meant to be. So it's um, meant to be, and what you know what? The plants, the chat question was, uh, do you, have you ever grown sprouts? And you're going to get into that, I think. So it, yes, we can talk a little bit about sprouts. I don't think it's actually within the list that we have, but um, I know sprouts are a uh, thing that's fairly easy to grow in, in actually within a kitchen. So I put this in, I think if some people have ever been through CIOS or the Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorship, they might have seen this. We've been using it for some time. It sort of reminds you to eat your colors of the rainbow. So the more colors that you have in your dish and your foods and, and, the, and the variety that you eat, the more health benefits you are getting, um, such as the red colors, they have lycopene in them. And the carotenoids are coming from your oranges, orange plants, your carrots, your squashes. So I like this slide just to show you the different uh, phytochemicals that are in the plants that we're going to be going through, which are helping with that, those benefits. Um, most of the benefits that we are talking about today, uh, we either had a research article or they were from the American Cancer Society. It'll be um, a list of those will be at the end under resources. So we started off with berries. Berries are great. A lot of times berries will just pop up out of nowhere, but if you do, you can go and plant your own plants. So blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, these are all sort of perennials. So they are gonna come back year after year once you plant them once. They contain antioxidants and lots of vitamin C and they uh, support, your, support you by protecting your DNA and slowing the growth of malignant cells. Um, most berries, if you are not planting them into the ground, will need a larger pot, so a big 20 gallon pot. Um, most of the time you will be harvesting berries within a one or two years after planting. So these are going to have to get established a little bit um, before they actually yield fruit. Most plants are going to need fertilizer at planting. And I'm talking an all-purpose fertilizer, which has a good mixture of all those things. Some plants will need other um, elements and I'll try to bring those up when I see them. Most of these plants will also be spring loving plants so you can plant them in spring. Um, sometimes with berries, especially you can trellis them. So they would be good to do um, in your vertical gardens, and they do like moisture. Uh, blueberries, you want to keep constantly moist. Um, 
blackberries, you want to water weekly, strawberries, you want to water weekly, and these usually need full sun. So I've added grapes here. Um, grapes have a seeds and skin have a lot of antioxidants and also anti-inflammatory properties. Um, they help by stopping the growth and progression of cancer cells. And there's research that says they can be especially beneficial with breast and colon cancers. Grapes aren't the easiest thing to grow. So I was debating whether to put this in. Um, you start with a grape root or a grape um, a piece of it, and then you plant them in the ground, usually again in spring. They do require full sun. They like well-drained soil, so you don't want to overwater it, especially if you have, excuse me, clay soil, because they want to have that um, well-drained soil and clay likes to hold on to water. Um, you don't quite have to water or fertilize these the first year you plant them. They like the fertilizer more for the second year, unless you have really awful soil. When I was looking up grapes, because they weren't something that I was really sure on how to grow about, um, the article that came up was from the Farmer's Almanac, and that's um, www.almanac.com, A-L-M as in Mary, A-N-A-C. And when I went on to that site, I put my email in and they sent me this really great gardening guide. So it had a lot of great information. So that might be something that people would want to look at to enhance this. That's great. Tomatoes. Tomatoes are fun to grow and there's so many different variety of tomatoes. So tomatoes contain lycopene, which is an antioxidant, which can help reduce your risk of a variety of cancer. Um, these tomatoes here are actually growing in my arrow garden. So these, these are the ones that are on my kitchen counter as we speak. And I looked for a dwarf variety. So I didn't have a whole lot of space in my kitchen in order to grow tomatoes hydroponically. So I found a dwarf tomato. These are called orange hats. So they're little orange cherry tomatoes that have been growing. So I'm very excited about how these are gonna turn out. Most tomatoes you can plant in the garden um, probably mid-April. Uh, they do like full sun. They do not like to get their leaves wet. Uh, water weekly, make sure they're getting that watering. Um, and then not only fertilizing when you start planting, but when they start to bloom and bear fruits. Tomatoes, depending upon the size of the plants, if you're getting full-size tomatoes, those good beefsteak ones or the nice heirloom or the Cherokee purples, you're gonna to wanna to put them in a big 20 gallon pot. Cruciferous vegetables. So these are all your, basically your vegetables that sort of grow in a head. They have lots of nutrients, including carotenoids and fiber. Uh, these components help your DNA, protect your DNA from damage, um, especially from carcinogens, which we know are cancer causing agents. These are your broccolis, your cabbage, your cauliflowers, your kales. Um, these plants can be planted a little bit earlier than just that April. They do tolerate cold and frost. So we actually had these in the ground um, by the end of February, beginning of March. Um, the kale, most of these you can actually put in containers, seven to 10 gallon containers if you wanted to do a container garden. Um, most of them are going to take a little, uh, two to three months to come uh, get as big enough to harvest. And mo most of them also need that constant moisture. They do want a lot of moisture with that. The only ones that I see, I don't see any that require less than constant moisture. Cauliflower can tolerate part shade. So maybe four hours of sun up to six hours of sun. And then um, these like to be fertilized every four weeks as opposed to just fertilizing when you plant and fertilizing when they start producing fruit. Garlic, I love garlic. I put garlic in everything except maybe ice cream, but 
garlic is a great herb and it's not that hard to um, grow, but it does, it's a little bit different. There, it's growing seasons a little bit off. Uh, garlic's anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antibiotic, contains lots of antioxidants. Um, they say the sulfur component of garlic can uh, alter the behavior of cancer cells. And there are some studies that say it's especially beneficial to GI cancers, so cancers of the stomach and the intestines there. Um, garlic, you can take your, a lot of times you can take the bulbs that you have from the grocery store, put them in a little water so they root, and then you can plant those. But they like to be planted in fall for the cool growing season or very early um, spring or even late winter in order to get that full big bulb. Uh, a lot of times you'll be harvesting these in July as opposed June, July, as opposed to, um, you know, later on in the season. They like full sun and onions. Onions you plant in the spring and fall. They Onions are a little bit different. They don't like cold. They need full sun and lots of watering. But these are all your white vegetables. These are your, what's considered white vegetables when you saw that uh, eat your rainbow guide to begin with. And then, you know, you can grow different colors of different vegetables. So I focused a little bit on the oranges for the carotenoids and your green leafy vegetables, including spinach and shard. Um, squashes, you know, things like acorn squash and butternut squash. Now these are going to, you can sell the, put these directly in the ground as seeds. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the problems that happen with squash, but these take a long time to harvest from sprout to harvest. They do like full sun. They will tolerate just a little bit of shade. And then also they want constant moisture and you probably need to be fertilizing at planting and then when they start um, sprouting. If you're doing these in containers, again, another large container, 20 gallons. Sweet potatoes are great. Potatoes are another weird, I, I don't wanna say weird, but a different gardening type. Whereas you take the eyes of the potatoes or the potato starts and you start them in some soil. And as they grow, you add more, more soil to cover the leaves and then the leaves grow back up and you add more soil. So they're creating those tubers and that root system that the plants that the potatoes are growing from. You want to start them indoors they take a good long time. They take a good four months to grow. Um, you know, they're usually done because the plant will completely die off. It'll be yellowed and then you can go and dig for your potatoes and see what you have. I just recently bought two potato containers that have sides that you pull down. So I'm hoping that those are gonna do real well in that. And then like peppers, uh, I chose orange peppers and peppers you can start indoors or you can plant outside. Um, they take another three months from sprout to uh, harvest. Peppers will always start out green. So if you ordered orange peppers, keep them on the vine a little bit longer. They're going to change color. They always turn green first. Um, water weekly, but don't water the leaves. Peppers don't like to be wet. Um, all purpose, again, fertilizer, and it also likes some fertilizer when it blooms as well. Peppers can be done in about a 10 gallon container, but also don't pull the peppers off. Cut them off so you can um, keep the stem intact and not break the rest of the plant. Now my green leafy vegetables, my favorite is Swiss chard. Um, Swiss chard also tolerates cooler temps, so you can start that early. Spinach also you can start earlier. Um, spinach is one that likes uh, heart shade. So that's the one I put right there near the building that had um, that shaded area. They also like nitrogen fertilizer. So you can fertilize more with a nitrogen fertilizer. Just ask whoever is in your garden center for that. Um, both spinach and Swiss chard can be grown in seven gallon containers. My last set of plants or herbs 
Not so much for the cancer fighting benefits, although there, there could be some, but because you can always use herbs in your cooking instead of salt, reducing your sodium intake and to really pump up the flavor of anything else that you may have grown. Uh, herbs do really well. I've mentioned when we did add hydroponics, herbs do really well on windowsill containers about seven uh, gallon containers, and they also do well in your hydroponic si systems. Uh, most of them will be the same. Plant in spring, water weekly. Do not overwater dill. It does not like to be over water. And my suggestion with mint is to plant it in a container. Mint is extremely invasive. Its root system goes everywhere. So if you don't contain it, it will take over everything. And mint is also good in shaded areas. My next picture is more about genomics. So I'm gonna head this off to Dr. Jagir, but you can see in this picture that we've already talked about tomatoes and broccoli and garlic and grapes. So Dr. Jagir, could you tell us about this? Well, I have a couple of chat questions I want you to knock off here first. So, okay. um, so growing the orange hat, the little tomatoes, uh, do you buy seeds from Arrow Garden or from anywhere I uh, and use it in the existing Arrow Garden? I bought seeds from a company that specializes in tomatoes. They were called Renaissance Farms. I was trying to buy from Baker's Creek, but I think COVID had a lot of people gardening and buying seeds and planting great gardens. So by the time I got to, uh, order seeds, Baker Creek was out of the orange hat. So I did find them at another company called Renaissance Farm who has a ton of dwarf varieties of tomatoes. I chose the orange hats just because I had researched them. So can, is there a, uh, a container that these grow in? Can you put different seeds in that container? Oh yes, yeah. so the Arrow Garden in itself has little pods, they're about three inches and then they have a, a sponge in there and you put the seeds in there, you let them sit in the water and that's what they grow from. So you can buy blank seeds or you can buy Arrow Garden kits. Um, I've had an herb kit, which did really well. I had basil and mint and uh, dill, I believe, uh, had parsley from that for quite some time, almost a year. And then I think I overwatered it and it finally died on me. But I've also taken things from the Arrow Garden and planted them in soil. So the other question is, I guess full sun is like at the beach um, in your yard. Uh, what does full sun mean? So full sun's at least six hours, if not eight. Um, most places, you know, will have some indirect sun morning and afternoon. And then uh, partial sun is sun that's probably coming through like leaves where it's gonna get some, a good amount of sun during the day and then come late afternoon, it gets a little bit more shaded. Grapes like full sun in the morning, but afternoon shade is okay. Okay, great. So, um, you know, Hippocrates said, um, use food as your medicine, medicine as your food. We have kind of converted that to you are what you eat. Um, we're going to talk about the epigenome or epigenetics in June. Um, but, you know, you have the DNA that mom and dad gave you. Um, it does not change. Um, that, that's unmodifiable. It can be mutated. And a lot of times cancers are happening because of mutation. But it can also be modified. And the way that it gets modified is sometimes during your life, I mean, really all the time during your life, uh, based on lifestyle, based on your environment. And uh, so one of the things that happens is that the DNA can actually get methylated. And uh, too much methylation is a, is a bad thing uh, from the standpoint of how the genome gets uh, transcribed and, and placed into proteins. Um, so we have a number of these plants here that are uh, hypomethylation agents, demethylation agents. Um, and then they overlap with the fact that um, the DNA is wrapped in <clears throat> this process called chromatin, uh, which is made up of uh, these nucleosomes, which is a bunch of, it's just a bunch of words. 
Uh, but histones um, are the proteins that wrap the DNA. And sometimes when the histones get acetylated, uh, they can unwrap and expose your DNA uh, to being transcribed when it usually wasn't going to be transcribed. So these are uh, inhibitors of that process of uh, histone uh, acetylation. Uh, so these are the reasons why fruit actually at the molecular level uh, can be good for you. Uh, the other question that I didn't ask, uh, Stephanie, is that we, do we grow avocados in the upstate? You can answer that, and then I have an answer as well. So the only in experience, in experience I have with avocados is getting the seed and putting the toothpicks in and trying to grow, and it becomes a nice houseplant. I have never been successful with getting an avocado from the houseplant. So we've gone to a, a number of farm-to-table restaurants. Um, my wife, after the first a child was born, became deathly ill when ever exposed to anything avocado. Uh, and they assure me at these restaurants that she will get nothing avocado because we can't grow them up here. There you go, which is great. And I'll have a little thing about avocados or probably on the list coming up in a few slides. Okay. <laughs> So the last thing that we wanted to talk about was just some of those common obstacles. You know, everybody's going to have, we're going to hit a little bit of bumps in the road when you do some gardening. Common things that happen with beginner gardening is planting at the wrong time. So like I said, you know, I, I've heard that living in the South here for just a few, that April 15th seems to be like the, the big gold standard that you can um, start gardening and planting in the ground because you're after the frost. Well, I did that last year with some of my plants like cauliflower. Well, cauliflower likes colder weather. So when I planted in April, they did not grow very well. And once the hot weather came, they did not uh, create heads there. Um, Dr. Jagir actually mentioning overwatering earlier. Um, so if your soil is wet to the touch, it probably doesn't need to be watered at that time because those roots really do need some of those spaces to breathe and grow into. And most of our soil does have that clay. It does, it does uh, surround those roots pretty well. A lot of times you'll have to sort of aerate it as well. Um, some plants, you know the plants that need constant watering, those are going to have to make sure your soil is always wet. Do not let them dry out. Uh, lack of fertilizer. So uh, most of the times, if your plants are yellowing or wilting or not, just failure to thrive, they're not doing too good, it's probably a lack of fertilizer or a nutrient that's not there. If you haven't had soil testing, so you don't know which nutrients, you probably could just use a uh, all-purpose one. But if you have that, um, do that soil testing, you know exactly what you need to put in there. And then so there, the main of There my was a question also about the fertilizing of broccoli and kale um, and those things. Uh, did you mean liquid or um, that was the question? I don't, I guess a liquid fertilizer? So there are different types of fertilizer. I believe the nitrogen one, if I was talking about the nitrogen fertilizer, um, they suggest a fish meal. I pulled up, let me pull up the broccoli here. I'm using the seed to spoon app here because this is the one that tells me about the fertilizer. That's broccoli doesn't need it. Um, bone meal and blood meal, I think, have more nitrogen in there as well. So it doesn't necessarily need to have a liquid. Um, there's also a fish and seaweed fertilizer, which has a lot of that nitrogen in it. That is a liquid. The seed to spoon has links to growing or anything that you need to grow as well. Fertilizers, containers, things like that. You can find it all on that app. And then let's talk a little bit about bugs. Bugs are the bane of the gardener's existence. Um, they, they're, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do about them because they're everywhere. Um, there are certain bugs out there that are going to attack certain plants. Squash bugs are horrible. You I have to watch for their eggs because they lay eggs on the underside of the leaves. So you have to take those off as well as killing the bugs there. 
And there are some things that are more natural that you can use to help kill bugs. I personally use diatomaceous earth. Um, you need to buy this and it's a food grade diatomaceous earth because there are ones some that aren't. Um, it is a fine powder that's fossilized crustaceans. And what it supposedly does is basically cut the little bugs and then they dehydrate and die. Unfortunately, it gets washed away in rain and in morning dew a lot. So you do have to reapply it. Also, if you have any respiratory issues, this is not something you wanna be breathing into your lungs. So wear a mask while doing that. You probably wanna wear a mask even if you don't have respiratory issues. Um, I also use neem oil. Uh, that has helped a little bit. You can find neem oil basically anywhere that sells um, your garden center. I found my neem oil at Ingalls. So, and I use that, but again, you also have to spray that pretty consistently to keep the bugs down. Um, I am known to take a few minutes after work to go out there with a glove on and start squishing bugs and using tape to take those soils off or take those uh, eggs off the bottom of the leaves. Um, sometimes you have to use a pesticide and I know, sorry about that. We are not, we're not advocating for pesticides, but sometimes if you are growing to a whole, to yield a good amount of harvest, it sometimes has to be done. So if that is a route that you're going to go, make sure one, you follow the directions on the container. Don't use it differently. Don't mix it with another uh, pesticide because you don't know what the reaction is. If it tells you to wear gloves or wear protective equipment, please do so. Always wash your hands after using it. Keep out of reach of children. And then you know if you're putting a pesticide on your fruits and vegetables, you're gonna wash your fruits and vegetables to get rid of that residual. So the last thing I wanted to talk about after we were talking about pesticides would be the Clean 15 and the uh, Dirty Dozen. Um, the Clean 15, these are things that you can buy in the store and sort of feel comfortable because they don't have a whole lot of pesticides in their growth or residual in the plant. And these are usually the ones that have the least amount of pesticides used as growing, which is great because we're not growing avocados here or most people aren't growing avocados or pineapples. We're not in that area that grows those or papayas. Um, I know a few people who grow mushrooms, but these are definitely ones that you can feel more comfortable if you're going to the grocery store that you can buy them and feel like you're not getting overwhelmed with pesticides. And then on the other end is the Dirty Dozen. So these are the ones that historically have used more pesticides in their growth. So therefore you may want to opt for a organic one in the grocery stores. But what, as you look through these, these are a lot of the ones we just went over. Spinach, strawberries, all the greens, your grapes, your tomatoes, your peppers. So we just went over doing a lot of these. And then also, if you're interested in doing trees, you have your peaches, your pears, and your uh, cherries. So in summary, I want to thank whoever made my art on the side. But right. it's That's some it's, heat thing or something. I don't know. I don't know what happened. It just started having this little wonderful thing, but I just let it go as abstract. No, it's a new trend. I like yes. it. Yes. So in summary, I want you to have fun with this, do a little research, use your imagination, go sign up to get some of the seed catalogs to your house so you can dream big. Look at what you have out there and what you could, how you can garden and, and the things that you want to garden. And garden what you want to eat because if you don't like tomatoes, don't, don't grow them. <laughs> they, your friends may like you, but it, there's, you don't need to have that much harvest if you're not going to be using it. So Stephanie, that was great and, and a lot of knowledge. Um, you alluded to the farmer's almanac. Uh, there's a there's uh, some comments in the chat room about um, you know planning on a full moon. Um, there was uh, uh, a comment from the uh, from a, a person who's got an 84 year old father who's a farmer that 
Uh, the first new moon in April, which apparently is April 26th, is when you plant stuff that goes in the ground. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. the Earth's almanac is a great resource for a lot of the. There are certain sets that do plant by the moon. They plant by full moons. They harvest at new moons, or vice versa. Um, knowing or knowing the guesstimate for your climate. If we know this is going to be there, that the farmer's almanac is saying this is going to be the driest summer ever, well, then you, you can sort of prepare for, okay, I need to figure out how I'm going to be watering this a little bit more often, or I know when the full moons are so I can plant um, according to that, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, so I, I think not only do you have all that sort of folklore and, and and um, predictions for weather, but they give you great information on planting and, and what to use with some of those things. So it's a cute little thing you can pick up at the grocery store and just look through and, and it is healthy. It is helpful. Okay, if you want to just go ahead and advertise a little bit of this. And that's so this is uh, obviously I work for CIOS and they asked me to add a couple of uh, slides for the Center for Cancer Prevention and Wellness. Uh, we do have a prevent cancer research study that we've been doing for it's almost three years now, if I'm not mistaken. I think we do have some people coming to their third visit, although COVID had put that off a little bit. It's a 90 minute comprehensive wellness analysis. So you'll get an information packet and a questionnaire to fill out beforehand and it'll gather all of that and it talks to you about your cancer risk and um, what things you can do to reduce your risk. Not only that, but they are taking a blood collection and a buccal swab. Um, I believe they're doing urine now and that goes into the bio repository so we can research those things later on. Uh, Leanne Perkins here that, you know, it's exceedingly clear that in many cases we are on a first event. We are our own first defense against cancer. So the things that we are doing besides our genes, we have things that we can do to prevent cancer. Uh, the study is free, 18 years old, old or older, uh, must speak English. And we are looking for that wide range of demographics. So gender, race, health statuses, anybody is available to do this. Um, and just to emphasize, the appointment is free. The, yes. the, all, all of that goes free. You get longitude and we'll see you every year. Uh, we'll see how you're doing from a body compensation, not compensation, composition standpoint. And, um, and we can just see, you know, what's happening molecularly when you're doing things good for your body um, in real time. And hopefully body. we can start looking at you know, figuring things out before we get cancer. And I think that's prevention's always been a great thing to figure out because we know preventing cancers and even finding early stage cancers is your best success. Um, if you are interested in this Prevent Cancer Greenville study, contact Julia, Julia, yeah, Julia Gates, that's the uh, website there, or you can call 455-CCPW uh, and somebody help you make an appointment. Yes, it's all free. You're not ch getting charged for labs. Um, everything's taken care of as through the study. No facility fees, no blood draw fee. It's free. Yes. And Julia and Susan Webb are great nurses. You'll talk to them yearly and they'll let you go through everything. So thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, that was great. Um, uh, we uh, want to emphasize that uh, this will be recorded and will be on the Kansas Survivors Park website. Um, so uh, if you're a budding gardener or farmer, or you know one uh, who uh, would, would uh, be interested in this information, uh, please let them know uh, that if they missed it tonight, they can um, see the whole thing. Um, probably with the slides looking like they do. <laughs> I need to figure out what's going on with well, that. I, no, I think that's a that's a done deal. So yeah, show your references and um, so, you know, just let them know about any um, website that you found particularly helpful and then we'll, we'll knock it off. 
Absolutely. So these were some of the research articles we talked about, about the berries and the grapes and garlic and onions. Um, the seed to spoon.net, um, you can find that app both for Android and for Apple. Uh, I, I downloaded about seven apps this year, and that's the one that I pretty much went to for all my go-tos. It was a great resource, and it's, there's a section where you can actually plan your garden as well. Um, and then, of course, cancer.gov, that's the American Cancer Society there. They talked a little bit about the broccoli and the cruciferous vegetables for cancer prevention. So we have this series, uh, it happens uh, in real time at the Center for Hope and Healing in the Cancer Survivors Park, uh, the second Thursday of every month. So on May 13th, our next um, uh, a cancer uh, prevention and wellness lecture will be uh, dispelling common misconceptions about diet, exercise and wellness according to new guidelines in lifestyle medicine. With significant changes in diet, exercise, and wellness recommendations over the last 20 years, one might find themselves asking the question, what does it truly mean to be healthy? Hint, it is not all about following the latest weight loss trend or fitting into your favorite pair of jeans. So on uh, May 13th, there'll be uh, two of our certified nurse practitioners, Gina Franco and Pam Cloys at the Center for Integrative uh, Oncology and Survivorship. Um, and they will uh, be presenting in a kind of Q&A style, a discussion dispelling common misconceptions surrounding diet, exercise, and wellness. Getting answers to questions uh, such as, uh, what is considered adequate exercise for me, uh, or a complete plant-based diet is not going to happen in my household, what else can I do? Um, or whether uh, you are a self-proclaimed health nut or just interested in learning how to easily incorporate healthier habits, uh, there'll be something for everybody. So uh, join us again, uh, second Thursday. And again, that will be on recording too. Um, as you know, I like to end with uh, a quote or a poem. Uh, and given the fact that it's been spring, um, this is a, a, a poem from Bobby Collins, who was the poet laureate at the uh, turn of the century. And it's called Today. If ever there was a spring day so perfect, so uplifted by a warm intermittent breeze that it made you want to throw open all the windows in the house and unlatch the door the, to the canary's cage, indeed, rip the little door from its jam. A day when the cool brick pass and the garden bursting with peonies seemed so etched in sunlight that you felt like taking a hammer to the glass paperweight on the living room end table, releasing the inhabitants from their snow covered cottage so that they could walk out holding hands and squinting into that larger dome of blue and white. Well, today is just that kind of day. So welcome to spring and happy gardening. It sounds like a lot of work, but uh, hopefully it's worth it to y'all. Share with your friends and please share with us any uh, other uh, kinds of subjects that you want covered in these, um, in these uh, series. So I wish you a good night from the Cancer Survivors Park where it's, again, always beautiful. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity.